Well, thanks, Chris, and welcome back from lunch. I hope you're not going to take a nap after lunch. <laughs> um, maybe I can help with that. Uh, let me introduce myself first. I am the financial services leader for a place called the IBM Research Think Lab. Now, uh, going back a bit, I got my PhD from the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab in 1987. So I've had a long road with IBM. Um, I, my PhD was focused on robotics, so I was not doing core AI. I wasn't doing machine learning in those days. Uh, but I was involved in the AI community uh, pretty much all the way through. And my current role is that um, in IBM Research, and we are at the core um, home facility of IBM Research up in Yorktown, about uh, an hour from here. And we um, host companies. We work with companies. We don't just do research to publish papers. We do research to help companies. So we work with companies every day there. And my job today is uh, to work with banks. I mean, that's the big thing in, in New York and, in, and for IBM ever since the beginning. We were founded in 1911 to help companies like banks to, to, to use um, large calculators and ultimately uh, computers. We, we've been working with banks ever since 1911 when we started, and I'm very lucky to have been working in the banking industry for the last four years, applying uh, the, the leading edge technologies that IBM brings to the market, and artificial intelligence is one of them. So that's my introduction. Um, before I get into AI, I just want to mention that the things that really, we really see, the technologies that we really see out of IBM Research and uh, all across the company that are changing the world of banking and other industries that we work in. I also work a lot in retail. I did a lot of supply chain work and I, and I did retail work. Uh, and healthcare is a big industry in IBM, but we have lots of industries that are being affected. These technologies are the ones that are really um, uh, changing the world. Artificial intelligence is right up there at the top. And what we've done uh, with our victory in a, a big chess match against Kasparov and winning the Jeopardy program on television was just the tip of the iceberg for what we're, we're doing in AI. But uh, also there's blockchain. And I've become uh, uh, an expert in blockchain over the past few years because you just can't get away from it these days. To me, it's the next wave of ERP. It's going to affect a lot of businesses in the next five years or so. Um, cybersecurity is even more important now than ever, and AI is even part of that because AI is fueling new forms of attacks and then also fueling new forms of defenses. So it's pretty interesting what's happening in cybersecurity these days because of AI. Uh, cloud computing, of course, um, that's uh, you know what a lot of what IBM is doing these days. Internet of Things, putting sensors everywhere and then trying to make some sense of it. And then finally, quantum computing, which I'll get into, which we see as probably the next huge wave of computing, and I'll be talking a bit about that later. So I'm going to give you today what I see as an IBM employee as the future of AI. This is not the future of AI for p other people in other companies or individuals in their homes, but what IBM views it as, or at least what I as an employee view it as working for IBM. Um, and uh, Ginny Rometty, who is our CEO, um, she sees IBM, uh, AI not as something that's going to take over the world, but as something that's just an extension of computing technology to help our clients uh, improve their business. So you really have to think of, if you want to hear the IBM story, you have to frame it that way. We have clients. We want our clients to benefit from our technology. <coughs> we want to put AI in our technology to benefit our clients. That's it. We don't want to take over the world, and we don't want AI to take over the world. And we're seeing, um, as AI rolls out, we're seeing three waves. We're seeing a wave that we call narrow AI. And in narrow AI, skills are not transferred. So if you build an AI model that can recognize a cat, then you build an AI model that can recognize a skyscraper, uh, and then you build an AI model to uh, make a hiring decision, there's no transfer of skills between those. So if you liken that to human beings, as humans grow up, they learn how to walk, they learn how to talk, they learn how to read, and these skills build up over time. And they don't lose those skills. Those skills get tied together into their neural networks so that they work together to, to learn new skills while not forgetting the old skills. And today, with AI, that's just not happening. We're way, way far away from that. 
to be able to transfer uh, learnings from one model to another. Uh, then we have something called broad AI, and I'm going to be spending most of this presentation on broad AI because that is what really is the wave that's coming in now. We believe that we're right on the cusp of, of broad AI. There's some broad AI already, and a lot of it that still needs to be invented. And a lot of narrow AI maybe will get better. If we do, can do broad AI better, then the narrow AI will get better too. And then there's revolutionary general AI, and that's like what you see in the, in the movies. So uh, let's dispense with uh, general AI very quickly so that we don't have to talk about it too much. But the movies have these robots and machines, and you can talk to them, and they're just like humans, and sometimes they're violent, and sometimes they're really smart and take over the world. And that's the, the revolutionary general AI. I don't know if and when it's going to happen, but we can't think too far ahead with that. Because first of all, um, that really isn't what our customers want right now. And secondly, it's, well, there's a lot of really hard work to do to get there, to even be able to approach doing general AI. There's a lot of other stuff that needs to happen. So I'm going to talk about the broad AI and the things that I think need to happen uh, before uh, anything can, can happen that's way out in the future. And by the way, if, if you want to hear predictions, um, we're saying that that general AI is 2050 and beyond. So people don't have to worry too much about it right now. Um, so let's, talk, let's start talking about narrow AI very quickly. What can we do in narrow AI? I'm sure that you're all here because you already know this. But we can uh, translate from one language to another. We can do speech to text. So we can ha have a, a contact center, a call center. And they can take the tapes that they get from the customers calling in. And they can turn them into text. And then they're more searchable. And uh, you can do data mining on them, things like that. Uh, we can understand language. Um, our Watson program won Jeopardy by uh, understanding language and, and answering questions on it. You can do machine reasoning. So you can make some decisions. We could get better at this. Reasoning is not something we're really great at. By we, I mean the whole world. But um, you can basically do some reasoning now by putting machine um, knowledge into an ontology and then taking that ontology and answering questions or making decisions around it, maybe building an optimization around the ontology. So there's a bit of this available today. And then there's object detection, uh, you know, <laughs> identifying football players and basketball players on the right, identifying LeBron James and some of the most famous players. Uh, you could probably go down to Times Square with one of these cameras and identify the, the celebrities whenever they show up walking around. So these are all narrow AI, but you can't take these models generally and use them for anything that's completely different. And not only that, but you can't even understand what's inside of them because they're neural networks and they don't want you to know what actually happened. So now let's talk about the broad AI and talk about how we're going to um, carve out the future of AI. This is a pretty busy chart. The rest of my charts aren't so busy. But this was a mapping that we did uh, a while ago, a couple of months ago, of things that we think we should be doing pretty soon. Um, AI everywhere. One of the things we want to get to with AI everywhere is we want to get to all the different industries. And to some extent, that's happening. Certainly with healthcare and banking and government, and to some extent, education, and to some extent, retail and energy. These, some of these things are happening. And, and IBM's working in all these areas. But it turns out we really thought, well, we're just going to go jumping in there after we won Jeopardy, and we're going to do all these industries. This is what we found out. AI wasn't robust for enterprises. Our customers are enterprises. AI wasn't re robust for, in a number, for a number of different reasons, and I'm going to be getting into them. Um, it also wasn't trusted, and it wasn't explainable. Uh, people generally don't trust it, and there's some good reasons for it, and they'll get into them. And um, it, explainability mm -hmm. is a huge issue, especially with increasing uh, compliance and, and personal information protection. Then you want to get into deeper insights. You really want to learn better. I mean, keyword search is so, is so old. Um, you really want to start to understand what's in the things that you read and see and be able to process it and combine it with other knowledge and be able to make decisions based on it that are good decisions. So one of the things you could do is just have better computing hardware. Uh, the lunch group that I sat with, that's all they talked about the whole lunch was how do you get hardware better and better. And I think that 
we agree in IBM. That's one of the ways that you can really jump on this and make it better because the more you can iterate in your modeling process, the faster you can iterate, the better models you can make. So as long as you have a slow modeling process, you're not going to be able to make great models and they won't be particularly reusable. So we're going to talk about um, distributed deep learning and neuromorphic and quantum and data-centric systems. Um, we just had a new announcement uh, about a week ago of a, a new supercomputer that's now the fastest computer, and it's a data-centric architecture, and it was funded by the DOE. So the DOE is interested in uh, very highly data-driven architectures um, that can do AI and other applications that they need. Um, engagement reimagined. So a lot of people focus on chatbots, which is good. Talking to a robot or talking to um, uh, a machine that's inside of a website or, or on the other side of a phone. But um, there's other modalities where, for example, you, uh, some of you might be robots in the future, so I might be talking to a mixture of people and robots. Or there might be sensors all over this room and I'm interacting with the sensors in some way. It might not even be speech. Um, it might be glances that I make or expressions or moving my hands that has some effect on the, my room, on the room around me. Um, there's personalization at scale. So uh, healthcare is a lot like this, personalized healthcare where you can uh, call out the genetics of a, of a patient and then uh, read all of the medical books and reports from the past 50 years and uh, then combine the treatment histories around all that information to find the best treatment for that person because of their genetic structure. That's really personalized. It's not based on what segment there is that that person is in. Uh, in, in my field, my current field, which is banking, the fraud management is important there uh, to be able to identify new anomalies that are coming out, personalized learning in the education field, an instrumented planet uh, is uh, highly related to engagement reimagine in the sense that as we instrument the planet, then that's more information that we can process, and that creates these big models that you then have to put into deep learning because uh, the old modeling techniques don't fit them anymore. So that's an um, expansive look at how we see what's coming up. I'll, now I'll just go into more detail on some of those topics. So first of all, when we started to hit all of these industries, to make uh, AI work, we found that it wasn't robust enough. One of the things was the, the learning step. Um, deep learning takes a long time if you're doing it using um, training, supervised learning. And um, you just can't get a good model quickly if you're going to be using training and, and each uh, training run takes you know in the order of a week or two. Um, you really want to get to, first of all, you might want to get to faster training, but that's something different we'll get to. But second of all, you might want to go to unsupervised learning or reinforcement learning or some other technique like that that doesn't require this huge amount of upfront training. So these are all things that, that we know that the world needs to get to and we have people working on them. Um, then there's the security and the ethics. And this, this is why uh, AI isn't trustable today uh, because it's open to attacks. Uh, in fact, AI models could um, be hacked so that you think there's an AI model that's doing this, but somebody hacked it and it's actually not doing that, and it's making credit decisions based on what the hackers wanted the credit decisions to be made on. That kind of thing could happen in the future. So they have to be secure. So IBM is really worrying a lot about the security of AI models. And then there's the, um, the ethical uh, nature of not using personal information for anything other than what it was intended for. So the GPDR uh, movement uh, rules in, in Europe are creating, are causing American companies and companies around the world to change their view of personal data because of the fact that uh, what we do might have a European customer. So let's say that I'm providing a service on the web and my service normally um, helps people in, in America. But then what if people in Europe log into it and they start using it? Now I'm under GPDR, right? So now I have to follow the rules for that, which means that if I'm going to use that information for anything besides what they in inputted it for, Let's say they were applying for a loan, and I say, okay, your loan is approved. Then I go take that information, and I start to use it for marketing. Well, now I have to tell them, I just used your information, I'm going to use your information for marketing unless you uh, opt out, or maybe you have to opt in in order to use that information for marketing, whatever. But that's GPDR. So these models, they have a lot of data in them, and the, mo and the, and the, the data is needed to make the model work for marketing or whatever purpose it might be used for. Now you have to tell them that you're going to use it for that. 
So there's a lot of issues around that, which we'll talk about a few ideas we have about personalized data and secure data. Um, explainability. So the great thing about deep learning is that you can put um, a lot more information into a model than you could before. So the model ends up better because you know, there's data that you used to throw out because it wouldn't fit, but you kept it in and it turned out that data was really important to reaching the optimal uh, conclusion. So now that that data is in there, that's great, but now you have a bunch of other data in there that's not really leading to, to the decision. So now um, somebody, you're running a bank, you just gave a loan, or you denied a loan, and then they say, why did you deny the loan? And you say, well, I don't know. I ran deep learning, and deep learning told me to deny it. <laughs> so that's a bit of a problem in the banking industry. Uh, there are fines for that. Um, so then you have to f find a way to get deep learning to tell you why it made the decision. So now you have to go back into that maze of neural neurons and figure out which of the neurons caused the decision. And now you have to worry about bias because um, it turns out that um, we tested a lot of AI models and a lot of them had bias in them. So I'll get to bias in a couple of minutes, but you have to start debiasing them. Uh, so compliance and regulations are really causing, especially in banking, are causing a lot of the pains that we're feeling in AI these days when we deal with enterprises. Um, so let's talk about bias. Now, my initial thought, and probably everybody's, when you think about bias, is you think about racial bias and gender bias, and you don't want people denied alone because of their race or their gender. So we did a study of this. We actually have teams working on this. This is a serious area of, of work in IBM. We found more than 180 biases. So that was really shocking that there's 178 more than we thought there was going to be. And um, an example, for example, is zip codes. Uh, you shouldn't be penalized just because of the zip code where you live in on a loan decision or some other type of action that a company takes. So these are the biases that we've identified and we're building tools. Uh, first of all, if the training data is accessible, we can pre-process it to make it unbiased. Uh, or these are our goals anyway. We're working, we're research, so we're working on stuff that may not be products yet. Um, and then um, if you have a trained model that's already built, at least you can detect that there's bias in it. So at least if you're in a, li in a position of liability because you have a biased model out there, at least, first of all, you know. So <laughs> it's good to know that you're in a position of liability. Um, and then we can start to fix it. Maybe we can go back to the training data and fix that. So those are the types of things that we're working on. Uh, then there's the private data. So when you have uh, this bank and it, this bank has told its customers, uh, I'm taking your data so that I can figure out whether you can have a loan, and then this bank over in France says, well, I'm doing the same thing, then if they take all that data and they pass it over country uh, lines so they can run a big model that can now, you have big data, you want to have a bigger model, you want to learn more about these customers, you probably violated some rules, and Europe is very strict. They probably violated some rules in Europe that you can't take personal data, sensitive personal data, and pass it over a country border. And the other thing is that they may have forgotten to tell the customers that they were going to use it for this other purpose. So we're now getting into a really tricky situation. So we're working on technology called Fusion that can take the learnings from this data model and send the learnings over to the Fusion Manager and take the learnings from this model and send the learnings over to the Fusion Manager and then um, fuse those results together into a model and it's, it's, it doesn't have any more sensitive data in it. Now this sounds like it's really hard to do. It is pretty hard to do, but it's a research topic for us, so we think we can solve it. Can I have a question here? Yes. So let's go 50 years forward. Is that going to be relevant? I would think increasingly. Because if we're saying blockchain and financial institutes are going to be eliminated and tokenization and the way we use currencies and all that, so why is it relevant borders of countries? Well, we, we, are using to we are using tokenization and we are using blockchain for it. I wasn't aware they were going to be eliminated. But who will be care about the borders of countries and you know, where really but it's, it'll be because of this technology that people won't care because we can prove to the regulatory agencies that we're not passing the sensitive data over. So this is how we're going to get there. Yeah. My question is if that's going to be relevant in the future, the agencies and the regulations that you're talking about. 
I can't, I don't know how, what, what regulatory agencies are going to do in 50 years, but I think this is going to make people more comfortable with the agencies and the agencies more comfortable with what the companies are doing. But I guess I don't know much about 50 years from now and regula regulatory agencies. Yeah, it seems like this is an answer to problems that exist in the real world. Yes. And if regulation stays like regulation is, <coughs> it will be relevant in the future. <coughs> and if regulation changes dramatically, we'll need a new solution. Right, right. Um, we, IBM bought um, a regulatory consulting firm to, to help us understand regulations better, um, promontory. So there are people in IBM that are keeping up with that, but um, I can't really speculate too much on it, other than to say that we're trying to, to help our clients become more compliant than they were before, especially with the increasing regulation. Um, so then there's the explainability. So really the key to explainability um, at the high level is that you're really going to have to go inside of these deep learning models into those networks and build submodels. And you can say it in a million different ways. You can call it attention modeling and some, several other ways, but you're eventually going to have to go into the submodels and, and understand the submodels as much as you're going to have to understand the big model. Um, so there's all kinds of drill down approaches for this, search approaches to figure out where the, the neurons are firing. Um, ultimately, it's going to require more powerful computers because you know just doing the big model is hard, but now doing the big model and then drilling down to find the smaller models that are causing the decisions to be made in order to get the explanations um, is going to be hard work for the computers. So we have to continue to push ahead with better computing technology. And you know, just as it always mm -hmm. has been, once you think you have enough firepower in a computer, then you don't anymore, and you're going to need more. And this is going to cause the need for more firepower in computers. Um, these are just a list of, of some of the uh, applications that, that we're looking at or would like to look at in all the different areas. I'm going to give a few specific examples. Agriculture is interesting. Um, what's happening today in agriculture, first of all, is that banks care about it because banks are the ones that pay for it. So the banks would really like to, instead of just saying yes to every agriculture loan that they fund, they would really like to know which, which farms are producing and which ones aren't. And they, if, if they could, they'd like to help the farms that aren't producing to produce better. Um, so that's one part of it. Um, they, there's a lot of drones and uh, satellite imagery now that, that is being used to analyze agriculture. Um, there's tracking with blockchain, so that creates sort of an IoT-like piece of information where this piece of lettuce or, or a, a cow is tracked all the way through the supply chain so you can go back and see what's happening. You can find out where the meat's getting tainted or um, where uh, things are being substituted. Forgery. You know, in supply chains today, it's really amazing. A lot of products are substituted somewhere in the supply chain, and by the time you get it, it's not what you thought it was. Uh, and this happens like in a distribution center, and it happens at alarming rates. I mean, two digit percentages of uh, forgery of products within distribution centers or, or a truck or whatever. So um, the tracking of all this information leads to this idea that with IoT, now you have more data and you can do more machine learning and you can detect patterns better. So agriculture is getting really, really interesting. It's really a very <coughs> mathematical field now, um, so to speak. Um, science, so I'll talk about quantum in, in a, a couple of minutes, but um, with IBM and other industries that, that make physical products, the, the materials that go into those products have always been really hard to experiment with. The simulations that we've needed to do uh, and the, the uh, lab studies we've needed to do on materials has always been very difficult and in some cases impossible. Some molecules it's really impossible on today's computer to simulate them. So with quantum we can simulate them better. We can also in the future run machine learning on quantum, so I'll get to that. Um, so that that machine learning can then come back and help you design your experiments and do your simulations better. Um, energy, uh, so I just mentioned that we uh, just created, the, again, once again for many, many years running, um, the world's fastest supercomputer with um, the Department of Energy. Uh, and the energy 
uh, industry has always needed really, really fast supercomputers, more, much more than other industries. But now these are data-driven architectures, as I said. So th they're architectures that can support really massive machine learning. So we're, we're supercomputers, if you can afford one, is going to give you probably the very best machine learning that you can get today. Uh, the second best you can probably get today would be System Z. You can put it on a mainframe, and it's also completely encrypted. And um, with the complete encryption that you have on a mainframe, you can do blockchain, and there's no nobody can break into a mainframe. It's just complete, everything's encrypted. And we can afford the overhead of encryption because the machine is very expensive and runs very fast. So it's not, it doesn't really matter that the encryption is an overhead on the, the runtime. So these are some areas that um, are important um, in retail. <coughs> of course, we're, we're doing all this tracking and, and blockchain. And um, now we have to run artificial intelligence on it to optimize it. Uh, so I'll talk about some of these other things in more detail. Uh, let me start with healthcare. So what we're, we're doing with Pfizer is we are um, putting um, wearables on the patients and also we're putting sensors in their houses so that we can give them a, what we call a disease score or what doctors call a disease score and automatically uh, give an alert when they just went from a six to a seven in the disease rating or score and then that sends an alert to the patient and back to the doctor that says maybe we have to up the medication. Uh, it could be voice, it, it could be activity monitoring, um, a great number of things. And not only that, that, that adds to what we're already doing with genetics and with uh, Watson reading all the medical books. So you add all that stuff together and you get a tremendous ability to, to do medical analysis. Uh, financial markets forecasting. So this one turned out to be a little simpler than we thought. Um, in financial markets, they want to forecast uh, the price of the, of the market and the volatility. And there were our algorithms out there that, that, that people use. Uh, but we came up with another one, and it's based on something called the dynamic Boltzmann machine, which is a form of artificial neural network. And I'm not going to go into the details of it. Uh, maybe the information is already out there. You can read about the algorithms. But these algorithms just turned out to be really fast. So the training is 15 times faster. So if you take the previous algorithms and you run this one on the same computer, Ours is 15 times faster and produces the same level of accuracy in the results. And this was done for one of our uh, top banking customers, uh, Mizuho Bank in, in Japan. Um, so this, I think, is just kind of a um, good choice of uh, artificial intelligence design uh, more than anything else. Uh, Cybersecurity. So now um, attackers are using AI to have smarter attacks. So then the defenders have to have smarter defenses. And the fact the defenders have to simulate attacks in order to, to be able to come up with the defenses. So it's getting even more complicated than it was before, partly because of AI. So that maybe is something that isn't great about AI, but we, we're dealing with it. Um, cryptography is another thing. Um, yeah. So. With quantum, which I'll get into, uh, people are starting to get worried about quantum uh, breaking security codes. <coughs> and in order to uh, fight that one off, we already have new security systems, which are generally referred to as lattice-based and sometimes called fully homomorphic encryption. And they are, they're better than any quantum computer is going to be in the future. So we're all, anybody who uses these algorithms is protected against quantum. It should quantum ever get to the point where it can break these codes. But quantum isn't near there yet, so we'll get to that. Let me do a time check. Uh, compliance, we can read compliance documents using Watson technology and figure out what to do semi-automatically. We can do financial crimes. Um, distributed deep learning, we take a whole bunch of CPUs and GPUs in the power series servers, and we hook them all together. And we came up with an architecture where you can, you can take a large number of these processors and hook them all together, and it scales linearly. So the more you put in, the faster the training run will go. It does not degrade over time. Now, that sounds like it's impossible, but they figured out a way to do it. So we've tried it on huge numbers <coughs> of CPUs and GPUs, and it doesn't degrade over time. The more you add to it, the, more, the faster it, it does learning. Um, so we took one model that our competitors took nine days to solve, and it took four hours for us to solve it, a standard model that people are using as a benchmark. 
uh, quantum computing. So quantum computing is not like regular computing, traditional computing. Instead of having bits that are zero or one, they are bits that represent um, an atom because we wanted quantum originally to do material simulations, so we wanted to have something that was a material. So we built an atom, and we put each atom on a, on a chip, and then we can, right today, put 50 chips together. The hard part of getting these things to work is that atoms are entangled. What that means is that if you have a material and then you have a bunch of atoms in it, they actually talk to, there's electrons that jump from one atom to another, and there's el electrical pulses and interactions between the atoms, so these are not like bits at all you actually have to entangle all the atoms a accurately so that they are actually talking to each other in a way that's predictable. So the entanglement is, is challenging. We have it working on 50 bits, but we have to chill the bits down almost to absolute zero so they're in a refrigerator. Um, so this is what the refrigerator looks like. The bits are down in the bottom of the refrigerator. And these are a couple of quantum people. And I'm imagining that they're talking about building a dynamic Boltzmann machine with their quantum computer and then doing real-time market forecasting. That's way out there. But I, there are people talking about that. So they're probably more like talking about, you know, how can they get up to 75 bits. But um, that's where we're heading with this is that you could have, this would be in a cloud and it could be really fast machine learning. So I am going to go right to the end. I think I'm about, about out of time and go on to the debater. You may have heard about the debater, which was um, uh, demoed in San Francisco about three days ago. And the debater uh, can not only, it's not like Watson that used to answer questions, but it's actually, um, you can take a debate topic, a randomly selected debate topic, and it will debate either pro or con on the debater topic. So here is a, a real debater, professional debater, and here is our debater computer. Um, and they're going to have a really short debate, and then the head of IBM Research is going to comment on it. I'll tell you ahead of time that what I really like about the debater is its ability to ingest information, understand it deeply, and then say something really intelligent about the multiple sources of data that it hears. So listen carefully to the first soundbite. And then I guess your robot learns from the human person and responds. Is that what's going on here? Uh, hi, good morning, Stuart. Definitely that's a piece of it. You take the statement and then you construct a full form speech, and then either the robot or the human can go first. And when the human speaks for its four minutes, the robot listens and then forms a rebuttal to that speech in a way that's fully coherent, fully cohesive, and can persuade the audience. <laughs> That's pretty fascinating, I've got to say. Can you tell us who won? Was there a decision at the end of the night? Who won? Who lost? Well, like in all debates, I wouldn't say there's a win-loss, but we polled the audience, uh, the majority of whom did not, uh, were not affiliated with IBM, and the audience said that, by and large, the humans were better speakers, more persuasive, but, the, but our artificial intelligence project debated was more knowledgeable and they learned more from project debater than from the human speaker. Arvind, what are you going to use this technology for in the future? I, I can see it quite a few use cases. One, um, as we want the public to get more informed on let's say legislation as well as the legislators themselves, they could use this to get uh, really informed the pros and cons of a particular position or a business executive rather than using uh, people with their built-in biases could use this to augment what they feel from their own experience and intuition to get and form all the pros and cons on a decision they're about to make. Can so really, I think, to augment decision making. Well, could I have one in my home? Because I spend a lot of time, my free time, 
debating with myself about the issues which I'm going to talk about next day on television. Could you modify this thing so I can debate the robot at home? Uh, absolutely, not just modify it. We intend to deliver it as a cloud service, so you're spot on in being able to do exactly what you're describing. Really? You could, you're going to do this? I mean, I could literally get out of the cloud and bring it down and debate the robot. Uh, uh, correct. You, you could give the robot a position. Actually, you could just listen. You could give the robot a position, and it could argue both sides of the position. <laughs> so you can get the best arguments on both sides. <laughs> Ooh, that wouldn't work. That just would not work. Okay. Okay. I'm afraid we're out of time, okay, but that that's was it. fascinating. That really was. I so speaking of out of time, I'm out of time. Uh, but uh, my boss here speaks better than me anyway, so I'm glad I ended with that, and uh, thank you for your time today.